Uh, that's the island. Oops. Okay, which one of these is which one of these is the pin? Up here. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, this should be good enough, hopefully. Okay. Okay. So um, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm gonna. We're, we're not gonna go as long as normal because I'm gonna pass your exams back and talk about it at the end. So uh, I want to get this done first. Otherwise, I'll just start ranting and I won't have enough time to finish everything I want to finish today. Okay. So I'm gonna do that at the end. I have to get through what I need to get through today. So we're gonna do that first. Um, but uh, I will spend some time to give your exams back and talk about it uh, at the end of class. Okay. All right. Some of you are happy and some of you are not. But I can't please everybody. So. Um, Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with, with okay, we've finished 2.4, but we're going to start by um, me giving you some help with um, one of your homework problems. So we're going to talk about number 5A, and I should, I should tell you that um, a couple of these problems require you know, a little bit of work, and I, I will just warn you that uh, I think I assigned... Six too. Um, you will probably need to, to give six a little bit of thought. Okay, that's, that, if you think that you did it in two lines, well, maybe you did, but probably you, it's not right. Um, you're you're going to need to do a little bit of work with number six. Okay. Um, so I, I want to, if we have time on Thursday, I'll talk more about this. But what I want to do is give you some uh, some help on number five a. Okay, and so 5a just says that if the GCD of a and b is 1, then the GCD of a to the n and b to the n is also 1. For all positive integers in. Okay, now here's the thing you have to say, or you have to realize. Um, if you think about primes and factorizations and such, and things that you learned maybe in middle school, um, there's a sense in which somebody said that this is, seems obvious. Um, so it's probably you, Christine, I'm guessing. Um, so you're kind of a brat. But um, I. Uh, there is a sense in which that's true. It, it is, in the sense that if you think about it in terms of prime factorizations, GCD of A and B being 1 really means, well, okay, this is assuming A and B are, are bigger than 1, but that they don't have any, any primes in common. If you were to factor it A and B into primes, there's nothing in common. Because if there was, then the GCD wouldn't be 1, right? It would be, that, it would be at least the prime that's in common to them, if not more than that, right? So if there's no primes in common to A and B, then when you raise A and B to the nth power, their prime factors are all the same, right? They just keep getting raised to the nth power, so there's nothing in common there either. So the GCD should be 1. Now, we haven't talked about prime factorizations yet, so unfortunately, your life's going to be a little more difficult than it will be later on. Um, but I, sh I also want to say something before we go into this. Um, if you have a problem in a given section, you need to use, I expect that you just use the tools that you've learned up to that point, okay? You can't just, you, you can't say, well, we can use this theorem 5 from, you know, May the 9th, which takes care of this in one line. You can't do that, okay? I'm so sorry. You can't do that. So um, you still have to do this kind of the, the tedious way using just what you've learned so far, okay? And what you want to do is this. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but here is r the sketch of, of how you go about this. Um, sketch of the solution. Um, the, the book actually gives you a hint. So the first thing you want to do is this. First, you want to prove um, number 20, part A of, um, I, I'm guessing this is section 2.3. So we have their, their book open. Uh, 
Does it say 2.2? But that's not true because there is no 28 and 2.2. The author means 2.3. Okay? Yes, you brought that. Thank you for bringing uh, that to my attention. Um, and by the way, just so you know, <laughs> the book tells you how to do it, basically. It says, here, here's 20A, do this. And oh, by the way, here's exactly what the solution is. They essentially do the whole problem for you. Okay, so do that first. <coughs> just follow what the book is giving you in the hand. It, it basically just works out exactly the way the book sort of outlines it. Um, so, um, and so what that is, I'll just write it down here. Um, let's see, actually, let me, <laughs> let me just open the book and make sure that I don't miscopy this. Okay, so GCD of A and B is 1, and the GCD of A and C is 1, and the GCD of A and B C is 1. This is number 28, so you should start by, by establishing this. And then from there, the cleanest way to prove this is to use induction. And I'm just going to give you kind of an outline of how you want to go about this. I'm not going to fill in all the details for you here, but I'm going to give you an idea of what you want to do. So I want to be very clear. This is not, if, okay, if I end up grading this problem and you just copy exactly what I, I've copied, you are not going to get full credit. So you don't come up to me afterwards and say, well, I just wrote down what you wrote down. I'm not telling you this is the polished solution. I'm just giving you a guide as to how you want to go about thinking about the problem, okay? <clears throat> so... The, okay, so what you're going to do is just assume, of course, that um, the GCD of A and B is 1. And what is it that you're proving? Of course, you're trying to prove that the GCD of A to the N and B to the N is 1 for every natural number N. Right? So the base case, I'm not going to write this down. The base case of the induction, of course, is just that the GCD of A to the first and B to the first is 1. But of course that's true because that's just the GCD of A and B, which we're already assuming is 1, right? So you should write that down, but the base case is just trivial, right? this around a little bit, sorry. Okay, so is everybody clear what we're trying to do? We're trying to prove this for every positive integer n. We're assuming that GCD of A and B is 1. Okay? So now what you're going to do is we're going to assume that the GCD of A to the N and B to the N is equal to 1. For some natural number N, right? And you have to prove that the GCD of A to the N plus 1 and B to the N plus 1 is equal to 1 as well, right? That's the inductive step. <clears throat> okay, so here's one way you can do this. So the first thing we're going to do, this, this I'll actually go through in a little bit of detail. First claim is that the um, GCD of a to the n 
and b is equal to 1. OK, so, and the reason I'm going to go through this is because this idea is going to come, come up um, a little bit later on in, in your argument if you kind of follow it the way that I kind of want you to. Um, not that you have to do it this way. I mean, there, again, in general, there are multiple ways to, to prove a theorem. So as long as it's correct, it's, it's fine. Why is this true? Well, we're assuming that the GCD of A to the N and B to the N is equal to 1. And let's see if, if we can see why that forces this to be true as well. Um, what if the GCD is not 1? Then that means that there is some integer. So the GCD is always a natural number. If the GCD is not 1, it has to be bigger than 1, then, right? And there's, oops, sorry. I'll just, okay. I'm too lazy to go erase this. All right. So then there's some integer d bigger than 1, right? Such that d divides a to the n and d divides b. Okay. Right? You believe that? The GCD is not 1. It's got to be bigger than 1. So we get this. Um, how does that, can you see how that is going to contradict this? Anyone see why that might be true? If D divides B, OK, this is, I'm not going to write all this down. This is where it's up to you to fill in the steps here. N's just some positive integer. If D divides B, then D certainly divides B to the N. Right? dx equals b, then dx times b to the n minus 1 is equal to um, b times b to the n minus 1, which is b to the n. So if you know an integer divides something, then that integer is going to divide every positive power of that thing as well. Right? So by this, you would get that d divides b to the n, but then d divides a to the n, d divides b to the n is bigger than 1, contradicts that. You see that? Okay, so d divides a to the n, d divides b to the n, um, d is bigger than 1, and uh, this contradicts our inductive hypothesis, right? Okay. <clears throat> Could you have just broken up like a to the n, t a times a, dot 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 times a n times, and then just gone about it that way instead of by like this way? Um. Yeah, I mean you can you can do that. Um, do you need to just say that a would be like prime one to the power times prime two to the power, or is that kind of unnecessary if you did want to go? Are you, t are you talking about, oh, you're, you're talking about here? In, yeah. in, or the, just the proof in general? Just, just in general, not because, like, when I said that this seems really obvious to me, mm -hmm. it seems like if A was, like, 2, so you have 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and D is 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, of course you're never going to have them. In, but if you picked a larger number to, and it wasn't a prime, because it may need mm -hmm. relatively prime, you have, like, prime 1, mm -hmm. prime 2, uh, no, I mean, I know what you're saying, but what you're, you could, you could possibly make that work out, but it's just going to end up being a lot messier than it needs to be, because then you're just going to be representing A and B as products of primes, which we haven't proven yet, by the way. So I'd rather you not do it that way. Yeah. Um, okay, so...
we've got this now, right? Um, here's what I'll say, and then I'm, I'm probably going to stop here in a second. Uh, let me use two asterisks so it's not confusing. So what, what can we do? Well, by number 20 part A, which I just told you what that was up above here, And I'm going to explain where this comes from. The GCD of A to the N and B to the N plus 1 equals 1 as well. Okay. So here's the idea, right? 20A says that if the GCD of two guys is equal to one, and then the GCD of two other guys is equal to one, but the, the left-hand number is the same in both cases, then the GCD of A and BC is equal to one. So as long as you have the same first number, and the, those GCDs are both one, then the GCD of that first number and the product of the two second numbers is also one. That's what this is saying. You want to think of it abstractly. Don't get hung up on the A and the B. Okay, so what do we have in this case? We've got the GCD of A to the N, B is equal to 1, right? Think of the A to the N as the A in 20A now. And the GCD of A to the N, B to the N is equal to 1. So in particular, those first numbers are the same. So 20A says then that the GCD of A to the N, B to the N plus 1, right? Multiply the second components is equal to 1 as well. You guys see this? Okay. So... Uh, oops, that's not good. The session has been launched. What happened? Oh, I, I, I hit something I didn't want to hit. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. How do I, I, how do I do that? Okay. Up right, up here? Oh, just up here. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah, sorry. I, I do know how to do a few things on a computer. <laughs> um, I feel really old now, but uh, okay. Um, we're so young. Huh? <laughs> compared to me, you are very, very young. Um, <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about drinking anymore. Um, okay. So, you guys have this down? Okay. All right. So, and like usual, I'm taking more time on this than I wanted to, but this is going to help you on the homework anyway. So, um, so what do we know? We know this is going to seem a little weird, but um, the GCD, I'm, I'm doing this now for a specific reason, which I'll tell you in a second. The GCD of B to the N plus 1 and A to the N equals 1, right? This is what I just wrote before, I think, except I've just flipped the order now, right? And I and, it, and this this is silly. This is the kind of thing I would yell at you guys for writing, but I, I'm I'm doing it for 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 I'm actually doing this for for an, a reason. I think this is the intuitive gain here is going to help. Uh, is going to warrant this redundancy. You believe that? Why did I write it twice? I wrote it twice for a reason, and it's actually good that I did that. Here's why. Because, <laughs> do you agree that we have the same first component in both places? And of course, the GCD of A and B and the GCD of B and A, it's the same. It doesn't matter what the order is, right? That doesn't matter. So what does problem 20A say? If we have the, first com the same first components and those two GCDs are both 1, then the GCD of B to the N plus 1 and A to the 2N is equal to 1 as well. Multiply the second ones together. Okay, see, I'm just using theorem 20A, uh, or sorry, problem number 20A applied to this particular pair of GCDs. And all that matters is that the GCDs are one and I have the first comp same first components, which I do. So I can apply problem 20A to this.
Okay, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to flip the order back around here. But so this is a to the two n, comma, b to the n plus one equals one as well. The i number twenty part a. Okay. No, well, no. I mean, yeah. Um, no, I, I guess you know what, what I'll what what I sometimes will say not to write a thing are things like five equals five and ten equals ten, and this is sort of along the lines of blah and blah. Well, you already said blah. You don't need to say it again. You know that kind of thing. But I'm doing it specifically so you can see how the problem twenty eight applies here. That's why I did it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this, this is why I did b equals b sub one, b sub two. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm doing it just so that people. I'm, but see, the thing is, I'm teaching this class, so I'm trying to, to write it down so everyone understands it. If someone's sophisticated, had sufficiently sophistic, good sophistication mathematically, wouldn't need to see this because they would just say, "Oh, yeah, twenty a, of course. I don't need to write it twice." But I'm trying to teach now, so it's the rules are slightly different for me than they are for you. Okay? What's that? Yes, exactly. Well, that's what I'm doing right now too. But um, okay, do you see where this is coming from? I, I kind of did two steps in one. Now I applied problem 28 and I flipped the order around again. Okay. Now I'm going to leave it to you now to from here to deduce that the GCD of a to the n plus one and b to the n plus one equals one. And the hint I'm going to give you, you can write this down. In fact, I would suggest that you write this down. Here's the hint on how to finish this. Is that two, n is a positive integer. So 2n is bigger than or equal to n plus 1. So once you've got a bigger power in the GCD being 1, then you can automatically sort of get it for free for, this, for the smaller power. Kind of like what I just did. Okay? That's the idea. And this is about the cleanest proof I could think of. And it's really nice and elegant. Induction, you don't have to write in a bunch of powers and a bunch of weird stuff. You can just do it very cleanly. So the hint is that 2n two, two is bigger than or equal to n plus 1. Once you know that, you can get it pretty quickly. OK? So I'll leave that to you to finish those few details. But you don't have a whole lot left to do at this point, really. OK. So uh, I should go ahead and move on here. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to just we're going to go into 3.1. Did anybody have any questions, by the way, about this, this last part here? No? OK. And this, is, this section will, unfortunately, annoy some of you. And there's just nothing I can, I can do about that. Um, this is called the Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. So here is the idea, what we're going to be doing in this section. is Basically what we're going to do is we're going to prove very rigorously all of the things that you learned when you were 12. And <laughs> you're going to think, well, yeah, I already know all this stuff. Well, you know that, the, you maybe know that they're true, but you don't necessarily, you never knew why they were true, really. You might think, well, you had some idea why it was true, but now you're really going to get, if you, well, if you, if you care, you're going to now have a good sense of where this is all coming from. Okay, so that is what we're going to do, and I'm going to. And actually, the way this is good though, because you can uh, you can relax a little bit because some of the stuff we're going to start talking about you already know. Prime number. Okay, so most of you already have an idea of what a prime number is, and of course, if you have your book open, you have the definition in front of you. But um, what? Uh, so first question is one prime. Is number one prime? It's not prime. You might say, well, why is that true? Well, because we just don't want it to be. OK? That's why. Because it screws up. If, if you allow one to be prime, it screws up certain theorems. Certain theorems become false if you let one to be, be uh, prime. And we'll talk about that once we get to those on Thursday. Um, OK, so one's not prime. So if we're talking about prime numbers, they're automatically bigger than one. right? And so and you all know this, right? that a prime number uh, is a number that um, is bigger than one and then has the only uh, Sorry, the only positive divisors of the number are one in itself, right?
Okay, so easy enough. And you all are familiar with some prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. I don't think I need to write those down. Um, so, yes, it's an if, if, it's an if and only if. So technically, so in definitions, technically the best way to say this is if and only if. Um, a lot of times, just the convention is, is a lot of times people just get lazy in mathematics and they don't say that. It's just sort of understood. When you make a definition, the if is, is if and only if. It always is. But yes, that's, that's true. It is an if and only if. Okay. Again, natural number bigger than one is composite. You've probably seen this as well. Oops, sorry. If n, we're going to make it as simple as possible. Um, n is not prime. Okay, that's what a composite number is. Okay, so that's easy enough. That should be an ITE. Sorry about the typo there, or pen O, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we're going to prove a lemma about composite numbers. This is maybe the most uh, annoying lemma that you'll ever see proved. But we're going to do it. is composite if and only if n equals rs for some integers r and s satisfying one is less than r is less than n and one is less than s is less than n. Okay, we're going to use this. That's a uh, well. This is the so essentially this is the theorem. This isn't the the definition of composite is not prime, and so we're going to prove that a composite number a number bigger than one is composite if and only if it can be written as a product of two things that are strictly between one and itself. Okay, and this shouldn't be too surprising really. Okay, so we have two things that we, we need to prove. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to assume that n bigger than 1 is an integer. Suppose that n is equal to r times s, where One is less than R, which is less than N, and one is less than S, which is less than N. And of course, R and S are both integers. Okay, so I'm claiming that N is composite in this case. That's what we're trying to do. I'm kind of going the second direction. We're kind of establishing then the first uh, hypothesis. Um, if n is equal to r times s, where r and s are strictly between 1 and n, then of course n is not prime. It's not prime because the only fa if n were prime, the only factors would be 1 in itself. And if r is between 1 and n, r can't be 1 and it can't be n. So it has a factor other than 1 in itself. 
So it's certainly not prime in this case. Yeah, and that's really all you have to say here. Then by definition, n is composite, right? Does everybody see that? Certainly can be prime. I mean, I could, I could write that out and say, oh, well, r is a factor that's not equal to 1 or n, so therefore it's not prime. I'm not going to write that. It should just be clear from this, right? <clears throat> okay, so let me wait until you get this, this down here, and I'll, I'll go on to the next page. I need more time? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I could always go back. Um, okay. Conversely, suppose that N is composite. So we're just going to prove this in gory detail here. So that means that n is not prime. Right? So if we know that n is not prime, we know the definition of prime is that the only positive divisors of n are 1 and n, right? if n were prime. So if it's not prime, what can we say? Joe. Yeah, that. Yeah, you're missing one small detail. But um, if it's not composite, that means it's not the case that the only positive divisors are one and n. So there's some positive divisor, positive divisor. That was the thing you were missing. That's not one or n, right? Okay, so makes sense. Well, I did the one that's less than r and less than n. Okay, well that's yeah, that's that's. Well, yeah, I mean. He doesn't want to admit it. No, 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 no. I mean, that's equivalent, to, that's equivalent to what I'm saying, yeah. Um, You're just telling me to be careful, I got it. Yeah, exactly. Um, then there is some positive divisor R of n such that R is not equal to 1 and R is not equal to n, right? Okay. <laughs> hence, so what does that mean? If R is a divisor of n, hence R times S, right, equals n for some integer s. You get that by the definition of divide, right? Yes, exactly. So that's just by definition of a divisor, right? If r is a divisor, it means that rs equals n for some integer s. OK. So. Now, as R divides N, I'll, I'll, let me make sure I get the, the quoted theorem right here. Um, by theorem 1, uh, let's see. from section 2.3, we 
we get that r is less than or equal to n. This is the first theorem that I proved when we started talking about divisibility. I proved this theorem that had like, you know, seven or eight parts. This is, this is a special case of one of those parts. <clears throat> okay. But remember that r is not equal to 1, and r is not equal to n. So what can we say? Well, 1 has to be less than r, and r has to be less than n. <clears throat> 